message for tonight. And we're going to be looking at, pick it up after uh, where we had left off last week. And of course, uh, the question I asked you last week is, uh, I believe it was, who, who are you? And uh, we looked at the difference was, he acknowledged that he was the king's cupbearer, the servant of the king, but he also acknowledged that he was a servant of of Christ, and uh, you know, he had uh, a dual responsibility, both as the king's cupbearer, but also, more importantly, as the servant of, of God, and uh, we always want to keep that in mind, but now we're looking at here at Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. I've realized this uh, in covering, looking through and reading through and preparing for these messages. Uh, we, we see some of these people as uh, in, in the Bible characters, there are several of them that probably stand out as people of prayer. I mean, we think about Elijah, right? And you know, even in James, the Bible tells us that uh, you know Elijah was a man of like passions as you and I. But he prayed, and God opened the windows of heaven for him, and uh, he prayed earnestly and fervently. When we think about Daniel and some of the others who were prayer warriors. But I, I mean, as we go through the book of Nehemiah over and over and over and over again, Nehemiah was a man of prayer above all else. And uh, just uh, it's, it's amazing to see him. We want to look at that tonight, and uh, particularly in verse, uh, I think it's verse uh, 4, where it says, So I pray to the God of heaven. And that's where I want to concentrate our attention. But we're going to read verses 1 through 8. And uh, again, the title of the message, So I Pray to the God of Heaven. Just taking it straight out of the text. It says that it came to pass in the month Nisan. And it sounds like a truck, doesn't it? Or a car, but it's actually a month. It says, So it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And then I was very sore afraid. When I said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchre, lie waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? And here it is. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Verse 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, but if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, and thou wouldest send me into Judah unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him. I mean, doesn't that help? You have the queen, kind of appeases his anger, whatever. It says, And the queen also sitting by him, How long shall thy journey be? And when will thou return? And so it pleased the king to send me, when I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me, uh, given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And what a wonderful testimony that is. Look at the guy's providence. So, so let us pray as we get into uh, the, the sermon for the night. Heavenly Father, Lord, may you encourage our hearts when it comes to the matter of prayer. Lord, as I look at the life of Nehemiah and some of the great things that he was able to pray, and just simple prayer. And uh, Lord, you were able to answer those prayers and do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. And Lord, may we have that same sort of conviction, that same sort of trust, uh, even as we sang just a little while ago. And Lord, you're good all the time. We know this, but let it be something more than something that we say, but truly believe deep down in our hearts. Lord, may we cling to your power and your presence and just lift up our prayers every single time for whatever the need may be. Lord, we've seen you answer time and time again, but Lord, may you grant... Lord, our, our, our trust be even stronger than it ever was before, knowing that you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There were two old geezers, and they were in the backwoods of the Ozarks. And I've never been to the Ozarks, but I knew just about where they are. And uh, so they were over there. One name was Rufus, and the other name was Clarence. 
And I mean, you know, just as old timers are, they are just always, uh, always starting trouble, I guess. One was on the one side of the river, one on the other side of the river, and constantly, every single day, these guys would be at each other, yelling from the other side of the river, and one day, you know, Rufus would get up, and he would shout, uh, uh, you know, Clarence would get up, and he would shout to Rufus, and he would say, you better thank your lucky stars that I can't swim, or I come over that river and I just whoop you, you know, <laughs> and uh, just very antagonistic. And then uh, uh, it would be the other guy, and Rufus would yell over, Clarence, you better be thankful to your lucky stars that I'm not able to swim over there. You know I'd be over there. And I'd straighten you out for sure. And so they would just constantly at each other for years and years. And I mean, time it went on by, and this just went on. Because finally, there, there was an Army Corps of Engineers, and you want to know what they did? They built a bridge across that river. Thank God for the Army Corps of Engineers, right? Uh, and they could build uh, in bridges and across uh, uh, just unimaginable circumstances. Well, they built this bridge, and just a nice bridge over there. And finally, after some years, they got it constructed, and, and all the excuses was taken away. I mean, the wife of Rufus, he got all, she got all upset. She says, for crying out loud, Rufus, I'm tired of hearing you threaten that old man. Why don't you just go across that bridge? I'm tired of hearing you yell every single morning. And he said, I will. I think I will. And I mean, he just uh, finally gets up some nerve. But he begins to go across that river and slowly, surely, halfway over. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, he begins to... He begins to run back over the house. He grabs his shotgun and climbs underneath the bed. And I mean, he's just all shaken to death. And uh, his wife says, For crying out loud, Rufus, what in the world has gotten into you? He said, Well, I failed to realize from this side of the river how big he was. I looked up and I saw that sign Clarence, 13 feet and 6 inches. He said, It didn't seem that tall on that side of the river. And uh, sometimes our problems seem bigger and what they actually are. Some, it's in those times, all right? Those times where we actually need to go to God in prayer when our problems are very big. And uh, thank God that, uh, you know, we have some more sense than that. But uh, anyway, when I look at Nehemiah, he's an amazing character in the Bible. And Nehemiah is not a preacher, right? We don't see him up behind the pulpit. He's not uh, like Ezra was, a, a scribe and just teaching the children of Israel all the statutes and commandments of God. He's not an eloquent person. He's not like Peter who stands up at Pentecost and preaches and thousands get saved. He's not a prophet like Elijah. I mean, he's not any of those things. But he is a very powerful person, particularly when it comes to the matter of prayer. And uh, Nehemiah is a man of prayer. He, he never rises to the height of Daniel. You think of Daniel and all the prayers that he prayed. And, uh, you know, we think of the times where Daniel would go and he would tell his friends, he said, I need you to fast and pray for me. The king has a, uh, has a dream. And if I don't interpret that dream, he's going to kill everybody. And they fast and pray and God gives them the interpretation of those dreams. But Nehemiah never rises to that level. Or even when we think of some of the things where, Nehemiah, where Daniel was just fasting and praying for it seems like uh, 20 days and he, the angel comes and he tells uh, Daniel, he says, for the first time that you humbled yourself and you got down on your knees and prayed, that God sent me forth, but it was the prince of the power of the air that kept me from coming to you. And, and I mean, we don't see those kind of things coming from Nehemiah. And I mean, Daniel was a man who was able to give some great prophecies, even into the book that we see over that John pens, the book of Revelation, and we see some of the similarities between Daniel and Revelation, what God reaffirms that he hasn't changed his plan. He doesn't really reach to the heights or to the beauty of, of a person like Habakkuk. I mean, Habakkuk had that way about him where he says, Revive us, O Lord. Revive us in the midst of the years. And he had a very powerful prayer looking into the future, seeing what God is willing to accomplish. He doesn't seem to... Uh, really rise to the level of uh, maybe a Solomon who prays at the, the, the dedication of the temple when he begins to pray, Lord, if your servants who have gone astray and they look toward this holy temple and uh, will you heal and forgive and turn them back from their iniquities, will you bring them back? And it doesn't really reach that level of eloquence that uh, Solomon has. But he's, he's more of a man that's sort of like you and I. I mean, he could fit down and to, to where you and I are. It's just these short, these simple prayers and 
but they're powerful. It doesn't have to be. I mean, sometimes we think that when we when we pray, we're sitting, and we're thinking like, okay, how, how can I put this in a way that might get God's attention? Do I have to be down here forever? Do I have to pray for an hour? Do I have to pray for two hours? Do I have to pray for four? Hours? How, what do I have to do in order to get God to answer my prayer? But all the prayers we find in Nehemiah, and he does pray quite often through the book. They're always short. They're always simple prayers. But they're always powerful prayers. I think uh, my time in college there, and I got to know Pastor Norman Johnson, who's now in heaven. And everybody who knew him knew that he always prayed these, they always said that he prayed these simple childlike prayers. He just, he was kind of, kind of got, you know how children are, they just believe that God can do anything. And they, they'll, they'll pray for some amazing things. I've heard my children pray uh, for, for incredible things. They're like, Lord, would you please have this uh, black guitar and this the black guitar that we saw at the Salvation Army last week and at this particular place at this particular time and, and, and please let it be there so, so mom and dad could buy that thing for me. I mean, they, they pray all kinds of things. I mean, sometimes you've heard children pray, Lord, can you give me a sister? Can you give me a brother? And, and, they pray, and you're thinking to myself, oh, <laughs> God, if, you, if you're in heaven, please don't answer that prayer. <laughs> you, know, you know, you have this kind of, but children can pray just about anything, and they just trust that God's going to give it to them. Norman Johnston, Pastor Norman Johnston, he was that kind of guy. Just very simple. Very, very, very... I mean, he, did, he wasn't there to try to impress anybody. He just... He was in touch with his Heavenly Father. And he just knew that God was able. And that's all there was to it. And folks, prayer means nothing without faith. We look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Again, this is another verse that we've all have memorized, probably. It says, but without faith it is what? Impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I believe that Nehemiah fits every one of these qualifications. Was Nehemiah a man of faith? Sure he was. Did he believe that there was a God? Sure. Did he believe he was able to reward him in his faith, to be able to send him down to Jerusalem to build the wall? Sure he did. He just didn't need no, you know, when or how or any of those kind of things. But he did believe that uh, if he just came to God, and we understand that he did come to God quite often, he did believe that God is, and he did believe that God is a rewarder to them that diligently seek Him. And all these things come to light as Nehemiah is praying. And uh, it's just really amazing when we consider his prayers. Why don't we go to God like Nehemiah and ask God for help when your problems seem bigger than you can handle? Right? Uh, it, you know, he just he doesn't give up. He just keeps on praying and praying and praying. Last week we saw how Nehemiah was a man of great faith. He was a cupbearer of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. More importantly, he was servant of the Most High God. News came to the ears of Nehemiah through one of the brethren that he knew personally, Hanani, I guess I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, Hanani comes over to, Jer uh, to Nehemiah and he tells him what's going on in Jerusalem. He inquires, he says, how's things going down in Jerusalem? And what he says, what well, Nehemiah is not good. Do you know the walls of the city? I mean, they're all, they're all the pieces. It's, it's, it's not good in Jerusalem right now. It's in great devastation. The people are in great affliction. Uh, they have no protection. And the news broke Nehemiah's heart. And it was Nehemiah at that point in time where he began to fast and to pray and to mourn and to intercede for his own country and for his own people and for his own land. And he didn't know what God was going to do. But he did, after acknowledging the situation, he turned to God and, and he prayed. He said, this is just the truth of the matter. Our people, we have sinned. I have sinned. Our people have sinned. This is just our history. And you, Lord, you know all about it. We're nothing desirable about us. But I just believe that if we humble ourselves and we turn to you, just as, as, as Solomon had prayed, we believe that you can heal our... We believe that you can bring us back. We believe that you can build the temple again. We believe that you can give us safety round about... Lord, we just believe you. And so he begins to confess his sins, begins to acknowledge the truth of the situation, resting on the promises of God of what he had says already. And the last thing he does is he, he prays. And we notice what he prays in verse 11. And I want to back up to chapter 1, verse 11. And halfway down, you see this. You see, 
his prayer. He says, Prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day. And I want you to get this. And he says, And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And the amazing thing about this whole text, when we think of the light of what he prayed in chapter 1, verse 11, and what happens in chapter 2, verse 8, we find that God answers that prayer. I don't know about you, but you know that's something that's very exciting. God answers that prayer. Now, it did take some time, but we understand it. It says in verse 8, And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And uh, it wasn't the next day when he was praying. It wasn't the next week. It wasn't the next month. And when we compare what it says over in Nehemiah chapter 1, and of course I'm not very good when it comes to the Jewish calendar, but I do know it takes some time. Nehemiah 1.1 1, 1, where it says, when it came to, And it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. From that time, from, from the month Chislu all the way to uh, Nehemiah 2.1 where it says, and It came to pass in the month Nisan. They tell me that it's a matter of four months where Nehemiah was down on his knees fasting, praying, mourning, and petitioning his God. And he just didn't stop. He just kept on praying. He kept on praying. He kept on praying. Eventually, God answered that prayer, and you can't deny that. We, we, as, as much as you want to, you can't deny that God answered that prayer. And uh, many times, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, and I believe that probably every one of us, and I'll just speak from my own self at this point of view, there's, there's been many times where I've been praying for something, and after, I guess, maybe two, three, sometimes I've made it to four weeks, I just say, what's the use? If God knows about it, sometimes I'll pick it up probably the next month and I'll just uh, space it out over the course of, the, uh, of, of time and I'll pray about it, but not as consistently as I used to. Not as strongly as I used to. Not as much faith. You know, this is my human nature is. I, I think to myself, well, Lord, if you would have answered it, you probably would have answered it within probably the first month or the second month. Maybe the answer was no and I just didn't get it. I, I don't know. And sometimes it's just it's easy to grow weary and to give up. And if Jesus gave that parable, when it came to that, uh, that widow woman, he kept uh, petitioning that, that judge on a day-to-day -day basis, and he just kept on bothering them and bothering them and bothering them, morning by morning, day by day, night by night, whatever the case may be, continually bothering that judge. And he said, will you please avenge me of my adversary? And eventually that judge, who didn't esteem God to be anything, he said, because this woman continually wearies me, I'll answer her petition. And Jesus tells us that how, that's how we ought to pray. And this is how Nehemiah prays here in our text. And so, again, we, we, we need to keep on praying. And I'm not talking about ridiculous prayers. We understand that God's not going to answer those. Lord, please, please give me a mansion tomorrow or something like that. Uh, if He gives you a mansion tomorrow, it might be that we wake up in glory and it'll be the mansions in heaven. I don't know. But... Uh, not talking about those times where God says no and He shuts the door and you keep on praying anyway, just hoping that He'll answer it. He's not going to answer it. Because He's already given you His answers, just like your kids continue to ask you, Mommy, Daddy, can we have ice cream? 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 And I done told you a hundred times, no, you're not getting it tonight. You're not having any sugar before you go to bed. We need some sleep too, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but we're talking about legitimate prayer that you set in your heart. Sometimes, what's the use? And may I encourage you tonight to take those prayers back up and commit them to the Lord. We must keep on praying, keep on trusting until God gives the answer. And uh, you say, well, Pastor, that's easier said than done. I know. I, I've, I've lived it. I know it. It's easier said than done. But we ought to keep on praying. It was a render of a minister in the 1800s. A guy by the name of Rowland Hill. He was said to be a remarkable man for the death of his piety. And, and when asked uh, at uh, Wanton Underedge, what a name, for his study, he says, Though I rather pressed a question, I did not obtain a satisfactory reply. At length, the good minister said, The fact is, we've never found any. We've never found this study. We've never found it in, in the garden. We've never found it in the parlor. We've never found it in the bedroom. Never found it in the streets. Never found it in the woods. We've never found it anywhere. 
And everywhere we go, we never found where he actually uh, studied, where he actually uh, committed himself to, to prayer and those kind of things. He said, well, but where did he retire for prayer? And he says, well, he was always praying. He was always praying. He didn't have to wait till he got to an office somewhere. He didn't have to wait till he got to the woods. He didn't have to wait till he got anywhere else. He was always praying. I want you to think of the patience of Nehemiah as he prayed. Nehemiah lived in the real world. You know, he understood the problem. And sometimes we, we set some of these Bible characters up on a higher pedestal than what we ought to. And we say, well, yeah, you're talking about Nehemiah. You're not talking about me. Well, guess what? Nehemiah could probably relate more to you than you could ever imagine. Again, I, I, I just recall to your memory, he, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't a preacher, he wasn't a prophet, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't uh, in a higher up office. Kind of, you would say, well, he was a king's cupbearer. Well, I understand that. But listen, folks, he, he had a job, just like many of you have a job. And so well, I'm a retired. Well, he never made it to retirement, but he worked a job just like you worked a job at one time or another. And uh, he would go to that job faithfully, and every time that he would show up to the job, he would just continue to pray. And he would continue to think about those things that were going on in Jerusalem. And he would just continue. He had his problems. Listen, he's just... Where, where was he? He wasn't at Jerusalem. He was in Babylon. What's Babylon? Babylon was a place of pagan culture. Uh, I mean, just you think of wickedness all the way around you. The, 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 the king, you think he was a godly king? No, he was a pagan king. Now you think that, uh, how do you think Nehemiah must have felt serving a pagan king? Now, of course, we look at the, we think look at Artaxerxes. And, I mean, this guy was a mighty guy. He he was a he was a guy that ruled all the way from India all the way to Libya. He ruled from all the way from the Black Sea to the to the Persian Gulf. He had a vast expanse of of what he ruled. And yes, he he had a great boss, but listen, he wasn't trying, he wasn't praying he wasn't praying to Artaxerxes. He was praying to the God of Heaven, and he continued to pray and continued to pray and continued to pray. Well, how long did Nehemiah pray? Again, four months is what they tell us. Nehemiah had been praying, he'd been weeping, he'd been fasting for weeks on end, and during that time he didn't miss a day at work. We know from this time forward, from verse 2, the Bible tells us, it says, Wherefore the king said to me, Why is I counted as sad? For four months he didn't show up sad, he didn't show up uh, any different than he normally would. He would show up to work faithfully and diligently and commit himself to doing what he had always done. The king didn't know, had any idea of what Nehemiah had been praying. He didn't have any idea what was going on in Nehemiah's heart. He just committed it to, to Almighty God. And I bring that all that to this point where Jesus tells us over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, He says, but thou, when thou prayest, don't, don't be like the Pharisee, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into your prayer closet. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. When I shut that door and pray to thy Father, which is in secret, thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Um, someone once said this, Behind life's frustrations lies a divine purpose that something can be learned from our most difficult experiences. And so, this is a challenge to me, folks. You know, he's not, he's not bringing it out in the open. He's praying to it privately, just trusting Against all hope, but against all faith. I don't know if you realize this or not. Go back to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra is right before Nehemiah. And I just want you to realize exactly what Nehemiah is praying. Nehemiah, uh, Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4 verse 11 of course, uh, the enemy's on the other side. They, uh, Ezra's down there. He's trying to get the temple built. And uh, Zerubbabel, all those are down there at work. And 
And then uh, there are some adversaries that want to stop the work. They send a letter over to King Artaxerxes. You find this in verse 11. This is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes, the king, thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such a time. Now I want to drop down to verse 17 just for sake of time. In verse 17 of this same chapter, Then sent the king an answer unto Rehum, the chancellor, and to Shimshay, the scribe, and to the rest of their companions that dwell in Samaria, and unto the rest beyond the river, peace, and at such a time, the letter which he sent unto us hath been plainly read before me. I have commanded, and a search has been made, and it is found in this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. Now, is that good news for Nehemiah? No. Verse 20, And there have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all countries beyond the river, and toll and tributed custom was paid unto them. And give ye now commandment to cause these men to cease, and that this city be not builded until another commandment shall be given from me. And uh, with that, let's read verse 22. Take heed now that you fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the herd of the kings? What, what do we just read? Artaxerxes said from his own penmanship, from his own handwriting, out of his own free will, he said, this city shall not be built. What is Nehemiah trying to get done? He's trying to build the walls around Jerusalem. Now, if you ask me, that is, a, that is an impossibility. I, I read this in the Bible that the law of the Medes and Persians doesn't change. Isn't that what we learn from, from Daniel? The book of Daniel chapter 5 where it says the law of the Medes and Persians, they, they, they do not change. This is where uh, uh, Darius, he tells, he signs this decree that uh, nobody ought to pray to anybody else. Uh, they're not to pray to any of their gods except for uh, uh, the king and him only. And Daniel goes out and he prays and they find him praying. As he goes, and he always does, and he prays three times a day. He opens up the windows, begins to pray to God. They take Daniel, they, they bound him fast, and they throw him into the lion's den. It's that same one where, where Darius can't change anything. He says, now, king, you know, the law of the Medes and Persians, they do not change. And despite the fact that Darius likes Daniel, because the laws do not change, he has to go to the lion's den. And it's sealed with his very own signet ring, sealed by the commandment of the king, and he can't get out. And though he shows up first thing in the morning, and he says, is that God that you serve? Abel? Uh, you know, how is it with you, Daniel? Does your God preserve you? And of course he did. He shut the lion's mouth. Is this same kind of rule that's in place for, for Nehemiah? In other words, what I'm telling you, this is an impossible situation, but Daniel was trusting in the God of the impossible. Who can make the impossible possible for us? I just find it amazing that uh, Nehemiah prayed anyway, knowing that this is the case, continually and consistently, understanding that God can do whatever He wants. There's a higher, higher court. Well, we think to ourselves, well, we know that uh, this prayer got answered. The prayer that we find in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11, where it says, in and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. We know that prayer got answered. What changed? Something had to change. You ever think of that? What, what changed? Uh, you know, he just changed this decree somehow or another. Some say this. Um, they say if you look at secular sources, the king was having trouble in Syria, just north of Judah. Uh, you know, it's not a very far distance between them two. One of the local rulers, a governor, called a satrap, is what they called him, had rebelled against the king and caused much unrest. And the king was in the midst of dealing with this. And uh, here was Nehemiah, one of his most trusted servants, wanting to travel to Jerusalem. And the king might have been trying to seize an opportunity to replace that, that source of trouble for him with somebody that he trusted, Nehemiah. And he said, well, you know, this, this is probably good news for me. Now, I don't know how true it is. I, I, I really don't know. I don't know where the source comes from. But they say secular sources verify this. And uh, all I know is that somewhere behind the scenes, God is at work for the very moment that Nehemiah begins to pray. And he doesn't see what's going on. And he gets up and he's praying, 
uh, you know, all through the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and back through the week again, as all throughout the four months of the course, of the, just looking for an answer. God, show me, show me that you're at work. Show me what you're doing. And he begins to pray, and he just keeps on praying. He doesn't know that God's at work. He's just trusting in the God to reward his faith as he prays for God to send him. Sometimes it's hard to pray for these impossible situations. But folks, while you're praying, I don't want you to to miss out on one of the greatest things in the world is God is working in behind the scenes of things that you don't know what's going on. You have no idea about. You don't know how it's going to work out. You don't know what God is working in the lives of other individuals. You don't know what God is working out in the realms of other countries. You don't know what God is working out. The only thing that we are sure of this side right now in our, 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 our days, I think it was Ken who was telling me, he says, did you know this person got up and gave a speech and said we're, we're, we're talking about a one world government and one world currency, and one world this and one world that. I said, well, the Bible says that. And I know that's where we're headed. But when it comes to these specific prayers, uh, what I'm saying is if you're praying for somebody to be saved, who knows what God is working in the life of that person? Now, they have their own free will, and I don't know what it's going to take for them to turn their life around or what it's going to take for them to look up. Sometimes God's got to knock the wind out of you before they begin to look up. But that doesn't mean we should stop praying. Sometimes we think about uh, uh, financial situations or other things that are going on. Listen, just um, it's just amazing. I... I uh, Brother Daniel, I hope you don't mind me using you as an illustration. But I think of some of the things that were, were taking place um, with him and his now fiance, and he was telling me about how uh, the deans moved down from New Hampshire and came down to his father's church, and that's where he met uh, Shelley there. And, uh, you know, that's where he began to, I guess, began to have that interest and say, hey, there's such a thing in this world as women, and man, she is, she is something. I don't know how it all worked out. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, okay? But that, I don't believe that that was an accident. And he didn't know, he, did, he didn't have any idea who she was. But God brought her down to her dad's church, his dad's church. And there's different things like that that are happening all the way around us. What I'm saying is, keep praying, keep praying. Don't stop, don't give up. Keep praying. God is doing something behind the scenes. Nehemiah's prayer the whole time didn't change. He didn't say, well, this prayer is not working, so I'll try another way, and I'll, try, I'll pray differently, and I'll, I'll pray uh, for something else, something else entirely. God, send so-and-so. God, send this person. God, God, God will you please uh, cause this administration to build a wall on the southern border? I, I don't know what the prayer is. All I'm saying is, Nehemiah's prayer never changed in the course of that whole four months as he began to pray. It was the same prayer over and over and over and over again. He began to keep praying. It didn't change. It was continual. He says, grant me mercy in the sight of this man. That's one thing that we do know for sure. Nehemiah didn't use the word king. It's interesting. He says, grant me mercy in the sight of this man. Now that tells me something. Though this guy was a king... He had a lot of power. Nehemiah said, this guy is just a man. He's just a man. God is able to work in his heart the same way he's able to work in my heart. He's just a man. God has put him in a position to be able to help me if, if God so, so wills it, and so wishes it, whatever God's will is. But he's just a man. God grant me mercy in the sight of this man. I can kind of hear that... Uh, Phrase, forgive me, from the Lion King. Uh, you know, where Simba says, uh, well, you know, guys, I'm just like one of you. Yeah, but with power! You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you know, he says, anyway, God might be preparing your heart for something. He might be changing your heart rather than your circumstances. Now, all I can say is this. We must be patient when the Lord speaks. We must say as Samuel, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. 
Nehemiah was looking for the answer that whole time. They didn't give up. The Persian law, it's uh, interesting enough, it forbid anybody to be sad in the presence of the king. And you show up before them, they, the king didn't care about your feelings. You show up sad before the presence of the king, you know, he could, he could uh, dismiss you from your job, he could banish you, he could even send you to death, but just because you showed up with tears in your eyes one day, you say, that, well, that's harsh, yeah. Tell me about it. He just kept on doing, Nehemiah just kept on doing what he always did. But finally there came this day and uh, he shows up in verse 2 before the presence of the king and he was obviously sad and the king took notice. And this is why when we come down to the last half of that, that very last sentence we find in verse 2, he says, Then I was very sore afraid. Why? Because he's sad and he knew what the consequences were. I, I believe this. Though he was afraid, and the king pointed it out, he realized this was probably an opportunity God is doing something here. Because it says he's afraid, but then all of a sudden we find in the very next verse, verse number 3, he goes from fear to boldness. Something, something swiss, something turned. He says, here's my opportunity. This is probably the time where God is going to use me. It's either, either this or I'm banished, dismissed from my job, or I'll, I'll be banished or I'll be executed, one of the two. It's either God grants me favor in the sight of this man or I'm dead. And he said unto the king, verse 3, let the king live forever. I mean, he reverences the king. He gives him his due respect. But he says, why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Nehemiah realized this, that this king didn't care anything for his God. He's a pagan king. One thing that the Jews and the Persians had in common was they had respect for the dead. And when Nehemiah begins to reference and talk about how uh, the graves of his father's sepulchers have been uh, um, just violated, I mean, it, it was something that uh, touched the heart of the king. You just didn't do that in that culture. And he says, all right, Nehemiah, what, what, what should we do? What are you, what's your request? What should I do about it? About those sepulchers, about your father's sepulchers? What should we do about it? How many of you know Proverbs 21 verse 1 says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. And boy is it ever evidence here where all of a sudden here's this change and he goes from noticing Nehemiah's sadness to asking him okay Nehemiah what do you want? What's your request? What's your desire? And it's all of a sudden now to know where he comes up with this answer. And you say, what, was this a spur of the moment kind of thing? No, I believe he was praying specifically for something. I believe that he was able to give an answer because that's specifically what he was praying about. For the walls to be rebuilt. And we find here that we must never overlook God's presence at work. The hand of God in these moments. Nehemiah was getting the answer to his prayer. And we see his boldness in how he responds. And uh, he just... Look at the king's response also in light of that. For what dost thou make request? And what does it say in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 again? We must believe that he is and he is a rewarder. A rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we notice the petitioning here. I believe that Nehemiah was able to present to the king what he had already carried to God in prayer. And so we find here what Nehemiah asked for. He says, send me to Judah. Send me to Judah. If it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, if thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulcher, that I may build it. Send me to Judah. The king asked a question, well, how long? How long are you going to be gone? And Nehemiah gives him a time frame. And then Nehemiah goes a step further in verse 7. He says, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me of the governors beyond the river that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. In other words, give me safety. 
Verse 8 in his letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beams. King, if you're going to send me, and if we're going to care about my father's sepulchers, we need timber, and would you please give me the timber that I need to build the, build the walls here? So it says, uh, uh, Give me beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, number one, for the wall of the city, number two. For the house that I shall enter into, three building projects that he's, carried, that he's trying to take on. And let me ask you this question. How much did the king, was he committing to? He, all he was worried about was his father's sepulchers. But Nehemiah goes beyond that. And he asked not only for, for the sepulchers, but also for the walls. And for his very own house that he's going to stay in during this time. He goes beyond that. Nehemiah addresses the king as I serve him. I think that probably helps. Well, interesting to note all the way down uh, chapter 1, <clears throat> we find that your servant is used eight times in the span of six verses. And it's always in the context of being a servant of God. Uh, he says, the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Uh, I don't see it in here, but um, let me just throw this in here. What I was really looking for is in chapter 2, over and over again, he mentions the king, the king, the king, the king, the king, the king, the king. Over and over again, he mentions the king. When he mentions the king in chapter 2, he's talking about the physical king. But at the same time, he has a knowledge that there is a, a king of kings, a God of heaven that's above all the rest, that God is able to supply the needs to get the job done, not only in sending Nehemiah, but also everything that he needs, the supplies and the utensils, the manpower, everything to make everything come to fruition. And it's that king of kings, the providence, the hand of God that we find here, as he says in verse 8, for the, uh, according to the good hand of my God upon me. This is what he is counting on, and he says, God, you have answered it. God's providence was the key to having that prayer answered. Nehemiah's success didn't because, come because he had superior skills. It wasn't because uh, he was just gifted in that trade or because he was something special. It only came because he asked. What does it say over in James chapter 4 verse 1? You have not because you ask not. And you ask, you know, you ask amiss that you might spend it upon your own lust. He tells him over in James 4, he says, You adulterer and you adulterers is just the same verse that I used in Sunday school this morning. You know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. No, you're not. You know, if you're going to be a friend of this world, you're going to be an enemy of God. And he tells him to draw near unto God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Folks, we've got to get to that point where we're drawing near unto God. He's trusting. All he did was ask, and he drew near unto God, and he presented himself before the Lord day in and day out, and just trusting in the providence. It's God's providence is the key to that prayer being answered. It wasn't anything that Nehemiah couldn't do. It wasn't because he was a better prayer warrior than you and I. What I'm saying is that every single one of us can have our prayers answered too. Nehemiah was not an exception to the rule. The amazing thing is this. 95 years before Nehemiah stood in the court of Artaxerxes, Daniel prophesied something. Go with me over to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 25. Daniel 9, 25. It says, Know, know therefore and understand. This is the angel that's speaking to Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem... 
Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the, what's that word? Wall. Even in troublous times. It's amazing the fact that when Nehemiah had dedicated himself to praying and petitioning this king, and the king begins to give his decree, when he goes down and he begins to build, it would be exactly as that angel told uh, Daniel that it would be from that very time when the walls would begin to be built, it wouldn't be long afterwards that Messiah would step foot upon the scenes of this earth and He would purchase to us. God was setting in, in, in motion that plan of redemption to save every one of us through the, through the Son of God. That's the amazing thing. And it was... <laughs> Nehemiah couldn't have thought about that, but it was in the heart of God. This is what God wanted to do for His people. This is what God wanted to do for us. And from that moment on was from the time that the clock began to tick until the Messiah would step foot upon the seat and He would give His life and die upon the cross of Calvary. And then when He comes back and returns again, that rapture, that last week, that week of time of Jacob's trouble, the book of Revelation as we've been going through, Revelation 4 all the way to Revelation 18. That week, we had a time that He was set in motion for that final kingdom that He plans to instate. The millennial reign of Christ. The clock began to tick from the very moment in the day that Jesus would be formally presented as the Messiah of Israel at His triumphal entry, and because one man prayed and waited, and because He planned and watched, and because God providentially moved in the life of that one man, God's redemptive plan of God will be set in motion and befit, benefit all of us. I, I just throw that in there for free because it's just an amazing thing that was added beyond what even Nehemiah prayed. We don't know what God's going to do when we pray. We don't know how it's all going to turn out. But we do know that God's will is perfect in every single way. We're coming to this time frame now that we Thanksgiving will be on Thursday as it always is every single year. A time of gratitude and a time of thanks. And I can think of no better way to end a sermon than to think of, of where Daniel said, And the good hand of the Lord was upon me. And how many times can we think back upon our own lives <laughs> and things that God has answered in prayer for you and I? Maybe throughout this year. Maybe it's been in recent weeks. And God has answered some of those prayers. You've been praying for your, uh, your grandbaby to be born and to be a healthy child and and God answered that prayer and we say the good hand of the Lord was, was upon me. And I believe that this was Dan, Dan, uh, Nehemiah's expression of great, uh, gratitude unto the Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you for answering this prayer. Thank you for sending me to Judah. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your plan. Thank you for allowing me to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Thank you for uh, uh, working all this out beyond what I could ever imagine. Thank you. And folks, that ought to be our heart's desire. Thank you for your good hand upon me. Uh, sometimes I think it's just amazing that God gives us another breath, another day to wake up, spend it with your beautiful wife and wonderful children, another day to spend it with God's people in the house of the Lord, another day just to be able to wake up and get up out of bed. Not everybody can do that. To breathe this beautiful air. Freely. <laughs> it's just amazing. Let us give God all the glory and praise. And let us also remember, as, uh, just in challenging this, are there some things that you may be praying about and you say, well, <laughs> Pastor, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. It doesn't think that uh, uh, it will happen. And you've given up on praying about some things and you don't know what's going on because I guess what God is at work. I challenge you, do not stop praying. Do not stop praying. With that, let's close in a word of prayer. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, You know that there have been many things that we've been praying about. So we come to a Wednesday night service. Usually I'll hear some of the men here who've been praying, and I guarantee you that they've been praying for years and years and years. Lord, that You would bless this church, and certainly You have. And that You would just uh, add unto the church that we would see some fruit of, of those prayers. Lord, we've been praying for You to to draw us closer in love and just help the fruits of the Spirit to manifest themselves among, among the brethren. We've been praying for people who have been sick and uh, we've been praying for people to be saved and we've been praying for special situations that's been going on all over, even some that uh, where we have missionaries that may not even be able to express everything that they want to share. Great prayers. Lord, may you answer them in your time and in your way. Lord, help us never give up praying. Lord, I'm thankful for how you've been using us here, and may you just protect uh, these here, and may you just encourage your hearts tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, I want to sing hymn number 276, where he leads me, I will follow. We'll sing the first and the last, 276. A stand two seventy six. Tommy, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?